thank you very much for that wonderful introduction and for uh, coming to this talk. It's a delight to be here and to talk to you about uh, evolutionary psychology, why students love it, how to teach it. Uh, I've been teaching evolutionary psychology myself for many, many years, starting at Harvard and then for a number of years at Michigan and, uh, and most recently at Texas. And so uh, because I teach it every year and I love teaching it, I'm always struggling to devise different tools that will enable students to understand the logic of both evolutionary theory and evolutionary psychology with greater clarity uh, greater depth. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a challenging thing to do because some of the concepts, even though evolutionary theory in its simplest form is a fairly simple theory, straightforward, shouldn't be all that complicated to understand, it turns out there, there are a number of complications, a number of cognitive biases, even perhaps evolved cognitive biases that interfere with our understanding of evolutionary theory and its application to humans. Uh, and so what I'd like to do today is to share with you just some of the tools that I've developed uh, in concert with, with colleagues uh, that I found useful in my teaching of the topic of evolutionary psychology um, to a variety of different audiences. Um, so um, now, of course, evolutionary psychology goes back to Charles Darwin. I view Charles Darwin as the first evolutionary psychologist for this prophecy, if you will, at the end of his 1859 classic book on the origin of species. He said, uh, in the distant future, psychology will, will be based on a new foundation, uh, that of the uh, necessary acquirement of each mental power and capacity uh, by gradation. Let's see if I can put that up here. Is that going to work? OK. Cool. Thank you. Um, Darwin envisioned his theory of evolution as applying to humans. Humans were not exempt from it, but of course in that first uh, book about evolutionary theory, he just alluded to humans at the very, very end. He knew his theory would be highly controversial, knew it would uh, deeply upset his wife uh, and his colleagues, and so, but this was in essence a forecast that yes, humans were not exempt from the causal process of evolution by selection as it shaped our psychological mechanisms. Um, now, one of the challenges that I have found uh, is that is conveying the notion of deep time. Uh, most undergraduates, for example, when you say, uh, think of something really old, they say, well, you know, like there is this band called the Beatles, you know, and they're really old, you know. Uh, but they don't think in deep time. And in fact, if you think about it, our evolved psychological mechanisms were not designed to think in deep time, to think in small increments gradually over thousands or millions of generations. The adaptive problems that humans had to solve and have to solve are in very tiny time increments. So an eye blink reflex to avoid a bug flying in your eye, how to keep warm, how to get food for your belly, how to attract a mate, how to build a coalition, how to avoid social conflict, how to cooperate with people. Okay, these are adaptive problems that deal that are occur in very short time intervals. And so we, we really were not designed to think in time spans of thousands or millions of years. And so it's quite a challenge. So I have a number of exercises such as things like looking at this, that, the current evidence for successive migrations out of Africa, the first one uh, being about 1.8 million years ago. And there have been successive migrations. And uh, practically every week, if you read the New York Times, they discover something like uh, an artifact present somewhere in Africa, the most recent one's 44,000 years ago that demonstrates that, that, uh, that yes, modern humans did evolve uh, in Africa and then migrated out and brought with them um, various uh, capacities, including the capacity for culture. Uh, you can talk about the evolution of brain size, which occurred over uh, millions of years, going from 500 cubic centimeters to our current brain size, which is roughly three times that size, roughly uh, 1350 cubic centimeters. 
sometimes uh, I talk about milestones in human evolutionary history. Go back to, you know, when placentals uh, evolved. When did mammals make their first appearance? What about primates, uh, uh, et cetera? Different uh, landmarks in the evolution of humans. And in my textbook, Evolutionary Psychology, I have a table that starts with the origin of life, okay, about three and a half billion years ago, and then talks about successive landmarks. And these are just simply tools for getting students to understand deep time, that, that things occur on time spans, not just like the Beatles or, you know, last year's, um, you know, uh, boy, you know, band, uh, but, but rather in spans of, of millions of years. Um, okay, a second, has to do with the fact that there are multiple levels of causation, multiple levels of explanation. Now, we know that as teachers, but uh, students don't often appreciate that. And there's a story that I use to illustrate this, and, and it's, 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 I call it the turtle story. Uh, and, and that is that, uh, and I don't know if it's apocryphal or not, but in the old days, uh, when professors lived in caves, the student came up to the cave door, knocked on the door, and had a, had a question that he wanted to pose the professor to the professor. He said to the professor, uh, on what does the earth rest? And the professor thought for a moment. He said, the earth rests on the back of a giant tortoise. And so the student nodded, walked away, but was still puzzled. Came back the next day, knocked on the cave door, and said, but on what does that turtle rest? And the professor thought, and he said, on the back of an even larger tortoise. So the student walked away again. And the third day, the student, the professor sees the student coming up over the hill toward the cave and waves the students away. He says, it's turtles all the way down. Well, <clears throat> there are turtles all the way down in some sense. There are multiple levels of explanation and the thrust of the student's questions were very apt. That is a search for deeper and deeper and deeper causal explanations for a phenomena. So in this particular uh, uh, slide, so we want to understand human behavior ultimately, but that behavior rests on a foundation of underlying psychological mechanisms, which I'm going to talk about a little bit more, but we also have a physiology, a neurology, a genetics, and evolutionary processes which created the um, human form that we see today. Uh, a third is that I confront uh, the three theories that are extant to explain the origins of complex adaptive mechanisms. Now, the first one, of course, and I teach in Texas, and so this can get to be a sensitive issue, is creationism, okay? The notion that a, a supreme deity created humans and all other organisms and all the adaptive mechanisms that those organisms contain, uh, and whatever he created is simply what he created. A second theory is what I call seeding theory, the notion that extraterrestrial organisms came down to Earth and planted the seeds of life, and then perhaps evolutionary processes then took over and we evolved into the state that we are today. And there are some adherence to seeding theory. Uh, the third is evolution by natural selection. Okay, now how do we deal with these things? Now I teach in Texas. Uh, and so there are a lot of people who do believe in creationist explanations. Okay, the way that I deal with this, and it can be a sensitive issue, but I haven't had any problems with it, is simply by reference to the scientific utility of the different theories. So if we go back, look at creationism, well, it may be true. It may be true that a supreme deity created the forms of life and the adaptive mechanisms that we see today. But from a scientific perspective, it's not a terribly useful theory. That is, it doesn't lead to new empirical discoveries. It doesn't have heuristic value that we, val the, that we value in scientific theories. Uh, it, whatever exists is simply what that deity created. Uh, and so as a scientific theory, although it might be correct, it's not terribly useful for us. Uh, seeding theory, 
uh, might also be true. And every now and then, you read the paper, usually they're in the tabloids, National Enquirer, you know, UFOs, um, extraterrestrials, seen, spotted, you know, there's evidence for them in the farm fields, and I'm sure you've seen it all. Uh, and perhaps that's true too, but is again, not a very useful theory. Uh, it simply pushes the causal question back one step to what created, what causal process created those extraterrestrial organisms, and then what causal process took those seeds that they planted and then transformed them into the organisms that we see today. So we're basically left with the theory of evolution by selection in its modern form, um, and, and there have been different evolutions of evolutionary theory, so to speak, since Darwin's time. Uh, since he didn't, in his time, of course, we did, he didn't know about genes and uh, differential genetic selection. Uh, but one of the interesting things is, is that uh, some interesting work that's been done by uh, Dr. Christine Laguerre and her colleagues uh, is that it turns out that adults can hold both evolutionary and supernatural explanations in mind at the same time, okay? That is, they can believe both in a supernatural explanation, a theistic explanation, as well as believing the causal process of evolution by selection. Uh, and so it's not the case that as people grow up in adults, they relinquish their supernatural beliefs, but it turns out we are cognitively capable of holding both in mind at the same time. Now, of course, it's essential to explain if students are going to understand evolutionary psychology, they have to understand the logic of natural selection. Uh, and to do that, it's important, uh, I've found, or, or useful, to talk about things that were known before Darwin even came on the scene. Okay, that is, there, it was known that, uh, or believed by some scientists, that change took place in organic structures over time. That is, there was evolution. Evolution simply means change over time. That's all the word means. And so if you actually phrase it that way, it loses some of its um, you know, controversial nature. It's just simply change over time, and we're interested in what causal processes are responsible for that change over time. Uh, it was also known before Darwin's time that characteristics of organisms seem to have a purpose. There was an apparent purpose to these. So the quills of the porcupine seem to be a defense mechanism against predators. The hard shells of the turtles, the, the nasty scents of the skunks, you know, these seem to have a purpose. They seem to have a function. And so these were observations made before Darwin came along the, the scene. Now, what was his challenge? The explanatory challenge of Darwin was really momentous when you think about it. Okay, he had to explain why change took place. He had to explain how new species emerged. And he had to explain the functions of the component parts of these different species. So that's a pretty hefty challenge, and a theory that could do all these things is a pretty important theory. Uh, and as Dan Dennett uh, said in his book, Darwin's Dangerous Idea, it's about the most important scientific idea that anyone's ever had. Now, of course, it's, as I said, fairly simple in its fundamental form, um, but it's fascinating to me that in the history of science, it wasn't discovered until well, approximately 1859 or, or perhaps 20 years before that when Darwin first um, came upon it. He talked about publication lag. Uh, Darwin was like the king of the publication lag. Um, but um, uh, so, so what are its ingredients? Basically, it requires three ingredients. There has to be variation, okay, so individual differences. Uh, some of those individual differences have to be heritable. Okay, so if you, you know, one example that I use is if you take a plant and a can of paint and you paint the leaves pink, will the next generation of plants have pink leaves? Well, well, no, they won't. This is an acquired characteristic, and so acquired characteristics are not passed down. Um, and there has to be differential reproduction by virtue of those heritable variants. So variation, inheritance, and differential reproduction Okay, everyone in this room uh, came from a long and unbroken line of, of ancestors, and if at any one point in that time, if any of our ancestors had failed to reproduce 
and broken that chain, that inviolate chain, no one, you would not be here and I wouldn't be here uh, to discuss this very issue. Uh, and so we are all descendants, but not all of us will become ancestors. And so each generation, each next generation, is a bit different from the parental generation, what Darwin called descent with modification. And so his theory of natural selection did a remarkable job. It explained these three things. Uh, it explained descent with modification or change over time um, due to differential reproduction by virtue of those heritable variants, those variants that contribute to survival or contribute to reproductive success as we now know it. Uh, those got passed on in greater numbers qualities that failed to contribute to survival or reproductive success basically bit the evolutionary dust. They failed to get passed on in, in greater numbers. And so you see descent with modification or change over time as a result of this causal process. Um, it explained the apparent purposive quality of the component parts, okay, that is the, the function of a mechanism, the function of an adaptation is the manner in which it contributes to a problem of survival or a problem of reproduction. Okay, and that's what we refer to as an adaptive function, the apparent purposive quality. And uh, also kind of remarkably, it united all species into one grand tree of descent. That is, we are related to not just other primate species, but all other mammalian species and all species going back to the origin of life three and a half billion years ago. So it's a pretty remarkable feat to have a theory that can do all those things, and Darwin's theory did that. Okay, but there was a problem, or rather a couple problems. Darwin was an amazing scientist in this respect, and I try to teach this to my students, he noticed that he had a habit of forgetting facts that were inconsistent with his theory. <laughs> Something that I know that I am, my colleagues are particularly prone to. Scientists do that. They're very fond of their theories. And so Darwin created a special notebook where he forced himself to write down those facts that were inconsistent with his theory because they troubled him and he wanted to deal with them. Okay, one of them is the well-known uh, peacock, you know, and he asked how could this weird, brilliant plumage possibly have evolved? This cumbersome structure is metabolically expensive and it's bad for survival. It's like an open, it's like a neon sign to predators advertising fast food. Okay, how could this weird structure possibly have evolved? Darwin even wrote in his notebooks or in, in his private correspondence, he said, the sight of a peacock gives me nightmares. Um, he also also noted uh, other puzzling phenomena. Sexual dimorphism was one of them. Differences in the size, shape, morphology of males and females of the same species. And his logic was as follows. Okay, uh, both sexes face the same survival problems. Both sexes have to eat. Both sexes, if they're warm-blooded, have to thermoregulate. They have to fend off predators. Why would the sexes differ in size, shape, morphology at all, given that they face the same survival problems? Furthermore, why would some species be extremely sexually dimorphic, like the sea lions down here? I don't know if you can see that well, but the male sea lions weigh on average 4,000 pounds. Female sea lions weigh on average 1,000 pounds. So there's a four to one ratio, and uh, the mating patterns of these beasts are really quite amazing to watch. If you're interested, you can watch them. They're out 50 miles south of Palo Alto, off the coast of, of uh, uh, on the beach in uh, Northern California, and in mating seasons, basically the males go at it. They have these huge tusks and these 4,000 pound animals pound and attack each other. They have a system known as harem polygyny, um, where basically the victor of these uh, same-sex competitions in the elephant seals gets access to a harem of about 20 females, and I know that some males in the room might think, well, that sounds like a pretty good deal. Uh, but it's actually not um, because it's extremely difficult for um, the male to maintain access to the harem to start with because those males who are deposed are not happy about it. Okay, 
uh, that, so they try to do what we call mate poaching. They try to copulate with the females when, the, when the, the, the alpha male is not looking. And then the females don't like that. They emit a bellow. The alpha male comes bounding toward them, beats them off. But then there's another mate poacher on the other side of the harem. He has to bound over there. It's so exhausting that uh, a male can maintain alpha status for only a season or two. And then you see him tired, exhausted, with wounds, kind of lying there, just barely breathing on the beach. Um, so I don't recommend it as a mating strategy. Um, uh, back to the, the central point. Okay, the issue is this. Um, what causal process could explain things like the brilliant plumage of peacocks? What causal process could explain sexual dimorphism? But also what causal process could explain variation across species in the magnitude of sexual dimorphism? So you have some species such as the elephant seals or sea lions that are extremely dimorphic. You have these are homodryas baboons that are moderately dimorphic. Males are about twice the size of the females. Uh, and then you have humans who are even less dimorphic. Males are about 8 to 12 percent taller than females on average, although it depends on what aspect of bodily dimorphism you examine. So upper body strength shows much greater sexual dimorphism in humans uh, than does height. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, and then you see some species like gibbons, a primate species, where the males and females are virtually indistinguishable. So these were puzzles that Darwin, Darwin wanted to explain, and he explained them and his nightmares went away when he came up with the theory of sexual selection. Sexual selection deals not with the evolution of characteristics because of the survival advantage that they gave organisms, but rather by virtue of the reproductive or more specifically the mating advantage that they gave organisms. So uh, he explained this by two brilliant, simple, but powerful causal processes. The first is inter, uh, intersexual selection or preferential mate choice. Um, uh, and the logic is as follows. Uh, this is what we're looking for, what's looking for us from a perspective of a female. How many females would prefer this guy? Just raise your hands. I got no takers. Um, well, the logic is this, okay, if it is the case that there's some consensus among females, if there's some agreement about what qualities are desired in potential mates, and those desired qualities have some heritable component, then over time what you will see is those males who have those desired qualities are preferentially chosen, those lacking the desired qualities basically get shunned, banned, excluded. Uh, rejected from mating, and so you see change over time that is an increase in the frequency of qualities that are chosen by females, okay, preferential mate choice. Darwin observed that throughout the animal kingdom, females of many species, most species that he observed, seemed to be more choosy, seemed to be more discriminating seem to be more discerning about who they would mate with. And so Darwin actually coined the term female choice to describe this process. Most biologists at the time dismissed it out of hand. They thought it would be, it was absurd that the evolution of species could possibly be under the influence of female control. Um, the other component is, um, is also very, so this is a very, it's a simple process, but it's very powerful in its implication. So what it means is basically all you need is those ingredients. Consensus, some heritability of that consensus, that is some heritability of the desired qualities, and then that iterated over time and you will see evolution that is change over time. So if it were the case, for example, that all women preferred to mate with males who had red hair, then this room would be ablaze with redheads. And looking around, I see that is not the case. So there are a few redheads, but clearly it hasn't been the dominant preference. But you see the logic of it. Um, the second causal process of sexual selection is, is intrasexual competition. And, and that deals with um, the sea lions that I mentioned or, uh, oops, oh. um, uh, this, these are stereotypic examples of intersexual competition. Again, logic very simple, very easy to convey, uh, and uh, exists in, in, you know, basically all sexually reproducing species. 
Okay, and so in the stereotypic example, two male stags lock horns in combat. Victor gains sexual access to the female. Loser ambles off with a broken antler, very dejected, with low self-esteem, needing psychotherapy. Um, but whatever qualities lead to success in these same-sex battles, those qualities get passed on in greater numbers. Qualities associated with loss basically, again, bite the evolutionary dust. They fail to get passed on. And so uh, now in some species, it could be things like size, strength, muscle mass, athletic agility. But the logic of intersexual competition is more general than that. So in our species, for example, although we sometimes engage in intersexual competition, I don't see it all that much what biologists call contest competition, this physical combat, we don't see it that much. I don't see it on my University of Texas at Austin College campus too much. Occasionally a fight breaks out, but that's not the main ways in which, those aren't the main ways in which males compete with each other or the ways in which females compete with each other for access to mates. So in our species, for example, we compete for position in status hierarchies. Status hierarchies are universal across human groups, formal, informal. Position and status hierarchies is linked with access to greater resources and access to um, more and more desirable potential mates. And so in principle, intersexual competitors need not even meet in order to compete. So there are different forms of intersexual competition, hierarchy negotiation, something called uh, scramble competition, and so forth. But you see the logic. So again, whatever qualities that are linked with success in intersexual competition, those qualities can uh, affect change over time, that is evolution. Okay, now, okay, this is still all very old hat. This goes back to Darwin, 1871, his, his second major book on, on the topic where he does deal with humans. Uh, biologists, as I mentioned at the time, were said that Charles or Chuck, or I don't know if they called him Chuck, but uh, Charles will go along with you on the natural selection. We can see survival. But this notion of females having choice, uh, totally absurd. Uh, and so the theory of sexual selection basically was ignored for 100 years. Uh, there was a little flurry of interest with the statistician that you probably are familiar with, R.A. Fisher, who invented some of the statistical techniques we use today. He was also a geneticist. And so he developed a very interesting twist on sexual selection theory. Uh, that I don't have time to go into, known as the sexy sun hypothesis. But, uh, but basically, it wasn't until uh, a century later, 101 years later, so uh, 1972, that a graduate student at Harvard University, Robert Trivers, came up with the theory of parental investment and sexual selection. And so after 100 years of, of sexual selection basically being in eclipse and scoffed at and laughed at and not taken seriously, it has now become one of the most important theories we have in evolutionary biology and extremely important, of course, uh, in understanding some of the patterns of mating that we see in humans and other species today. Um, so um, it's, of course, important to talk about the core tenets of evolutionary psychology. Now, so I've written uh, some papers about these. Um, an American psychologist, other colleagues have written papers, Tooby, John Tooby, Lita Cosmides, and others. So there are more technical and detailed um, papers that you can refer students to. But just in a nutshell, I think that it's important to understand that um, uh, some of the basic tenets of evolutionary psychology. So very briefly, what are they? One is that all behavior is an interaction between evolved psychological mechanisms and input to those mechanisms. So one thing, one example I use is a simple one, the callous producing mechanism. So, so do people, you know, uh, walk around and all of a sudden calluses spring out of their ears? Okay, no, you get calluses by an environmental event, repeated friction to your skin. So calluses grow and they are designed to grow specifically on those areas where you've re experienced repeated friction. So if you want to explain why do humans have calluses and what explains the thickness and distribution within and across species and within and across individuals within cultures, uh, sorry, not species, with cultures, uh, you have to understand that there is an environmental input, repeated friction that 
activates an evolved physiological mechanism that is designed to produce new skin cells that then function to protect the anatomical and physiological structures beneath the skin. Uh, and, so, um, and so it's fundamentally, and the same thing you can apply, I, I start out with calluses and then I go through some other examples, jealousy. Do people wake up in the morning insanely sexually jealous? Okay, no. They, the jealousy, uh, and there's good evidence that human males and females have jealousy or something like it as an evolved psychological mechanism. It gets triggered by specific forms of input. Is your mate displaying cues to infidelity? Are mate poachers coming and hitting up on your partner? Uh, are there uh, contextual features that activate uh, possibilities of defection from the relationship, such as a mate value discrepancy opening up between the two partners that triggers. So it requires contextual, social contextual uh, input before the adaptation is activated. So evolutionary psychology is fundamentally an interactionist framework, and in fact, it, it's, in my view, the only cogent interactionist framework we have. So every psychologist in the world, I'm sure if we pulled everyone here at APA, said, are you an interactionist? They'd say, oh yeah, I'm an interactionist. Do you believe that both environment and nature, nature and nurture, have important things to say about him here. Yeah, yeah, I'm in the rush. I believe they're both. Okay, yeah, but that doesn't help us. It doesn't go very far. We have to specify the precise manner in which these interactions occur. And understanding evolved psychological mechanisms does that by identifying the mechanisms, the input that they were designed to take in, the input that they were designed to be sensitive to, whether it be repeated friction or cues to infidelity, that provides us with a powerful interactionist framework that's lacking in most of the rest of psychology. Um, second, um, all psychological mechanisms at some basic level of description oh, originate from evolutionary processes. So uh, uh, I was fortunate in, in when I taught at Harvard, B.F. Skinner was also there and I had a few conversations with him. And if you talk, and if you talk, of course he's dead now so you can't talk to him, so you have to take my word for it. But he said, and he's actually said this in print as well, that uh, yes, uh, he believes that classical conditioning, operant conditioning, these fundamental uh, laws of learning, he believed that there were these two fundamental learning processes. Yes, they owe their existence to evolution by selection. So Skinner, even Skinner, the most ardent, quote, environmentalist, was an evolutionist as well. He just believed that the number of mechanisms that we had, including learning mechanisms, were few in number and highly domain general. Um, a, a work in, um, from a variety of fields has, of course, challenged that view. We now know that the number of evolved mechanisms is, is much greater, even the number of learning mechanisms, far, far greater than those that Skinner envisioned. Um, how am I doing on time here? Um, doing okay? I'm still on teaching tool number three. I better hurry up here. Uh, but just to take a very quick example, uh, we know that there are specialized learning mechanisms, for example, in food aversion, food, food aversion learning. Uh, that, that even John Garcia demonstrated in the 1960s. That's different from, um, say, kin aversion learning, so incest avoidance learning. You, you have to learn, we're not born knowing who our genetic relatives are, but we have to avoid mating with them. Uh, and so there are incest avoidance um, uh, uh, learning mechanisms, and they turn out to be very sensitive to who you grow up with, so proximity of the individuals and uh, co-residents while you're uh, growing up turns out to be an important cue that triggers, uh, this is a member of my kin, can result in mistakes sometimes, but that seems to be a reliable cue that it's sensitive to. But that mechanism, so you have food aversion learning, kin incest avoidance learning, you have hierarchy negotiation learning. So what are the criteria in your local culture that are critical for status and reputation? Okay, and those things also have to be learned. And we have, if you go to the Ache, a hunter-gatherer group in uh, Paraguay, good hunting skills is critical for status among males in the Ache. Now, it's not, I know, in my psychology department. So I wouldn't, if I walked into a department meeting and slapped down a deer that I had just 
taken down, that will not raise my status among my colleagues, I can guarantee you. So we have to learn what criteria are relevant to our local group in terms of status and reputation. So these are just three quick examples, food aversion, incest uh, avoidance, and, and status and reputation, and there are likely many more. And so, um, and so the key point that I'm making is that whatever mechanisms we have at some basic level of description, they owe their existence to evolution by selection. Uh, and so you can run, but you cannot hide from evolution by selection. Um, okay, uh, I'm gonna very quickly go through this. Um, uh, there's variation among evolutionary psychologists, but many endorse the view that you can describe psychological mechanisms as information processing devices. And I think that it's very useful to do so. So as I said, with calluses or cues to infidelity as input, we have representations, procedures, decision rules, internal uh, cognitive mechanisms that process that information, and then ultimately produce some form of output in the form of calluses or behavior. In the case of uh, the jealousy example, the behavior ranges from vigilance to violence. Uh, so, you know, do I, you know, start keeping a closer eye on my mate? Do I beat up that intrasexual rival? What is the relative formidability of that rival compared to myself, et cetera? Uh, and so this is a useful way to describe um, evolve psychological mechanisms. They are, of course, instantiated in the brain, not in the big toe. I don't probably have to tell you that. Um, and critically, they're functional. Okay, and this is something that oddly was scoffed at in much of the field of psychology. Uh, now, not, not in William James. If you go back to 1890, William James, who was an evolutionary psychologist, thought function was extremely important, uh, but, but it became unreputable to talk about function, but in my view, it would be like if you, let's say you were a medical researcher, and let's say you are a liver specialist. I said, what is your area of expertise? It's the liver, that's what my area is. And then I ask you, well, what is the function of the liver? And you say, well, I don't know, I don't care about that. It's not an important question. Well, you would think there was something very important missing in my understanding of the liver if I didn't know what it, it was, its function was, in this case, to one of it being to break down toxins, to uh, filter out toxins so that they don't damage your other bodily organs. Same is true of our psychological mechanisms. We have to understand what their functions are. So that's a critical and indispensable step in the process. Um, ultimate and proximate causation. This is a difficult one to get at. And so, in other words, what we have to do, and this is related to understanding its evolved function, we have to understand, ideally, we want to understand the phylogeny. That's often very difficult to do because we don't have a videotape of our evolutionary past, so we can't go back in time. Um, there are a lot of clues, and so there's a certain way in which we can go back in time. But nonetheless, we have to ask, uh, not only how a mechanism operates, but what its function is, what its evolved function is. And so, um, in I, I, taught, I remember teaching a graduate class at the University of Michigan, and I could not get this distinction across from him uh, to, to this one male graduate student, who you, you would think at the University of Michigan there would be very smart graduate students, which they generally are, but this guy just could not get it. Everyone else in the class got it, this guy couldn't get it. So finally, in exasperation, I asked him, um, I said, why do you think men are taller on average than, than women? And so he thought for a minute and he said, because they have longer bones. Well, at that point I gave up, but uh, in, in, in a sense, he was right. He was describing in a proximate sense, yes, if you measure the bones of males and females and add them all up, there's a proximate sense in which that, quote, explains why males are taller. But we find that scientifically unsatisfying. We, we really want to push that causal step back. That is what causal process resulted in males being taller than females on average. And that basically boils down to, to the likely ones being sexual selection explanations. So either female choice, uh, females preferring taller males iterated over time, taller males having a slight advantage in intrasexual competition, or perhaps something else that there was a division of labor on, such as hunting, although my Aceh 
anthropology colleague um, Kim Hill tells me that that actually tall hunters have a disadvantage because they're too clumsy and predators, their prey animals can see them coming from a mile away and so he thinks that short hunters in the Aceh have an advantage and of course he himself is quite short and so he might have a <laughs> bias in that. But the, the key point is that we want to push that causal step back. We want to understand why. Okay, and that why question is, is, and so sometimes I use that long bones um, explanation to, uh, to convey the, the, the need to understand ultimate as well as proximate explanations. Um, uh, teaching tool eight, I'm gonna have to start speeding up here because I realize I'm going too slowly. Uh, we have to understand that humans were not designed to understand the causal process that created our psychology. I alluded to this earlier in the introduction where I said, you know, what are we, what are we designed to do? We're designed to solve adaptive problems in the here and now. Okay, keep warm, you know, get food, protect your children, you know, avoid predators, avoid infectious diseased individuals. Okay, these are immediate adaptive problems and so our, our minds are not designed to think in in time spans of evolution. And this is a, a Lar Gary Larson is one of my favorite cartoonists. I don't know if you can see this. this. is a man looking, explaining to his son as he's looking at a, a sparrow. He said, and now Randy, by use of the song, the male sparrow will stake out his territory, an instinct common in the lower animals. Now, this kind of illustrates, of course, they're surrounded by fences displaying that humans do display territoriality, but he's, of course, oblivious to that. This is just an instinct common in the lower animals. And so there's a sense in which we are blind to our own adaptations. So as I said, what, what is the human mind designed to understand? It turns out it's even worse than that because, um, ironically, we have evolved cognitive biases that actively interfere. So it's not just that we don't understand, we, we have biases that interfere with our understanding of evolutionary processes. And again, this is work by Dr. Christine Laguerre and colleagues. And I'll just mention two. One is essentialism, okay, that is we believe that species have this internal essence that is unstable over time and unchanging in its nature. Now, of course, this quote cognitive bias is very useful. If you, if you look at a sea turtle, in an individual's life, it is unchanging, okay? So turtles that aren't evolving very rapidly in our lifetimes. And so the view that turtles have this underlying internal essence that's stable over time is very useful. But it interferes with our understanding of evolutionary processes, which are gradual and occur over time. And so I have uh, uh, Darwin's finches there that show that, you know, there's adaptive specialization, change in the shape and, and um, uh, morphology of the beaks of different finches on different islands to correspond to the size and shapes of the nuts that were available on those different islands. And so, and so uh, this essentialist bias is, interferes. And also we have a teleological bias. Okay, that is we, we, we and it is, again, it's very useful to, un, to attribute desires and motives and intentions to other people because that helps us to predict their behavior, but it can be misapplied. So we say like the sun is trying to come out. Well, the sun doesn't have a motive to come out, I'm not trying to do anything, right? So we misapply it, we sometimes apply it, misapply it to animals. So the, why does the giraffe, why did a giraffe have a long neck? Well, it's trying to get to the tops of the tall, the tall, uh, the leaves on the top of the tree, and so that straining, you know, that, that's what explains it. Well, that does not what explains it, okay? It's a different causal process. Okay, those giraffes that happen to be, have a bit longer necks, uh, actually succeeded. Um, in getting those uh, taller leaves. With giraffes, as a parenthetical note, it's actually more complicated than that. There's evidence that the gi giraffe necks actually, actually play a part in intersexual competition. They use their, their, their heads basically to uh, like a whack the other males um, and uh, beat them out. Five minutes? You see? Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> Moving right along, use examples from the human body. Okay, liver, lungs, heart, larynx, cows producing mechanisms, very useful. Use other examples, animal examples are very helpful, I find, because it's often, even with mating, okay, it's useful. There's a fascinating literature on insect mating patterns and insect mating systems and insect mating adaptations. And in fact, uh, my reading of insect mate guarding 
strategies and adaptations was what led me to start studying human mate guarding and mate retention strategies. And so, but looking at other species is helpful because we do have this kind of uh, anthropocentric bias. We sort of see everything through the lens of our own species. And so looking at other species is sometimes helpful in that respect. Um, another example, use examples that, another tool, use examples that relate to students' lives. So mating, cooperation, um, aggression, uh, co common clinical problems like depression, eating disorders, uh, social conflict. And it turns out that these topics, which are so central to most sexually reproducing species, are also central to the lives of students. And students care about them. And so that gets their attention. And it's not random. You know, that they're obsessed with things like mating and social conflict and aggression and, you know, parent conflict with parents and so forth. Um, uh, I use thought experiments, and I have a whole list of them, and uh, I'm, a few of them are available on my website, but I'm working on uh, publishing a longer list of what I call thought experiments, which are basically just get ways of getting students to think about things. And one of them I use is, is uh, what I call a mission impossible experiment to get across the modern genes eye perspective on genetic selection. And as what would you do if you're a gene? You're, you are a gene. Your mission in life is to replicate, to replicate more successfully than other genes, competing genes. What would you do if you were a gene? And so students start to think about it. And they start now, well, genes inhabit bodies. They're not just isolated. So maybe you might want to do, for example, increase the survival of the body that you inhabit. So if you have an effect that increases the survival of the body, then that might help. And go through a few other things. So basically, uh, the three big categories of things. So you increase the survival of your body, which we call your vehicle in, in um, in some sense. Uh, you want to make copies of yourself, so you influence your vehicle to reproduce, and that involves doing things like influencing your vehicle, your body, to find fertile mates and to do certain things with those fertile mates, et cetera. Uh, and then also, in terms of modern inclusive fitness, uh, aid the survival and reproduction of other vehicles that contain copies of yourself, that is, genetic relatives. Okay, so this thought experiment, getting students to think about it, usually students come up with the first two very rarely. Maybe the exceptional, really bright student will come up with a third. But it really helps them to understand modern evolutionary theory in, as we understand it since the inclusive fitness revolution. Um, other things list all the qualities that women want in a long-term mate. Women, this, women go on for half an hour about this. I fill up five blackboards worth of things women want in a long-term mate. I ask men, I get about a blackboard and a half, and men run out of ideas. And so the women in the class have to help them. Well, don't you want this? Don't you want that? And then, so with women's help, we get a bit more. Um, uh, list all the things that you know that men have done that irritate, anger, annoy, or upset women. Okay, again, women are very voluble on this topic, and I have 147 things you can do to upset a woman, if you want to know them. I haven't even scaled them by how upsetting they are. But these things, these, these, those thought experiments help get students interested in attending to the topic, and they really get into these topics. Um, uh, a Surgeon General's warning, okay, I issue at least three Surgeon General's warning, and as I, you know, for me, life is too short to, pussyfoot around the truth, okay? So I just lay it out there. First, there are dark sides to human nature. Yes, we are not all, you know, you know what do they say about girls or, you know, and boys are, I know, puppy dog tails and whatever. Girls are all sweet and fluffy and everything. Well, humans have, have a dark side to their nature, okay? We have adaptations to inflict costs on other humans of various sorts, ranging from physical violence to other sorts of things like, you know, damaging their reputation and kind of uh, what's sometimes called a relational aggression. So you have to be explicit about that. Yeah, no, we are not a uh, purely wonderful cooperative species that is corrupted by bad parents and bad culture and Western influence. Okay, yes, we do have adaptations for cooperation and altruism. We also have these darker elements, cost-inflicting elements. Important to be upfront about that. Sexual conflict is prevalent, and I go over, I have a lot of my own research program is dev devoted to sexual conflict. A lot of it's caused by things like short term mating, infidelity, and so forth. So, you know, as soon as the 
Kristen Stewart, as soon as she admitted to cheating on her boyfriend, or Rob Patterson, you know, then I get a million calls from the media wanting to know why and what explains this and, you know, why do people do things, weird things, or what about Charlie Sheen? You know, why is he so gone, gone off the rails? Um, okay, speeding along here, I, I apologize, I've taken too long to get to some things. Surgeon General's warning number three. There revolve sex differences. Um, I'm sorry, I should be uncontroversial at this point, but there are. Okay, just as men and women differ on average in height, in upper body strength, in body fat distribution, and things like that, we also differ psychologically in certain domains. Where do we differ? We differ in domains in which men and women have faced recurrently different adaptive problems. We have a different reproductive biology. Fertilization occurs internally within women, not within men. That creates an adaptive problem for men, the problem of paternity uncertainty. Some cultures use the phrase mama's baby, papa's maybe to capture that asymmetry. Females but not males have that obligatory nine month investment to produce a single child. Minimum investment for men is much less. So there are these important aspects of our reproductive biology. And to an evolutionary psychologist, it would be absolutely astonishing and defy logic if you have these fundamental differences in human reproductive biology between males and females and you had an identical mating or sexual psychology. And of course, there's a tremendous amount of evidence that we don't. We differ psychologically where we face different adaptive problems. We are similar, males and females, psychologically, where we, we've, in essence, faced similar or the same adaptive problems. Um, so um, uh, another one is the issue of falsifiability. That comes up a lot. Well, you know, there wouldn't be, you know, 8,000 studies in evolutionary psychology that have been published in refereed, peer refereed journals that are well respected if the hypotheses weren't falsifiable. Well, they are, and so I think it's helpful to talk about some that are and some that aren't. So there are a bunch that have been uh, uh, confirmed by empirical data, or at least are, uh, have a fair amount, a fair, fairly sizable bodies of empirical data that support them, and there are some that uh, have been falsified. So the kin altruism theory of homosexuality, for example, the notion that males have an evolved preference for virginity, one of my first studies falsified that, that hypothesis across cultures, and the so-called loser male design feature, feature of uh, the rape hypothesis, that also has been falsified. Turns out it's not just loser males who engage in rape. In fact, there's some evidence that even males who are in a position of power, males who are in a position to get away with it, um, are more likely to rape. So, uh, so there are hypotheses or design features of hypotheses that in fact have been falsified. I think it's important to show a sense of humor um, you know, after all, we're dealing with serious topics, so it's important to light up, so it's lighten up. So I sometimes show my students a cartoonist rendition of the male brain, okay, which is perhaps too derogatory toward the male brain, including especially the listening particle, which some women <laughs> seem to resonate with. Uh, this uh, cartoonist generated this is the female brain. Now, I think this is really wrong, um, and you know, we can say, well, what is the actual empirical data? Uh, but nonetheless, it's sometimes useful to lighten up a little bit. Uh, another tool is to explain the heuristic value that is evolutionary psychology guides us to important domains of inquiry. And that's a hallmark of an important scientific meta theory. It guides us, it tells us that things around mating and kinship are gonna be very, very important. Uh, it's consilient, okay, to use E.O. Wilson's word, uh, a phrase, okay, that is it organizes facts parsimoniously, provides important guidance to new domains, leads to new predictions, and unites the field uh, of psychology with all the other life sciences. It's important to be um, humble and honest. We don't know a lot about psychology, much less evolved psychological mechanisms and all their features. We discover more each year, each month, um, but it's important to be upfront about what we know and what we don't know. And the last point that I want to make is it is 
an extreme privilege to work in this time. Can you imagine work being a psychologist in the era of, I don't know, behaviorism or, or phrenology or something like that? It is an exciting time to be working in the field at this time in the midst of what I believe is the most important scientific revolution in the field of psychology that we have experienced. So if you're interested in these teaching tools, I have them all available on my website, davidbuss.com, and I apologize for going a little bit over, but thank you for your attention.